please stand with me for the call to worship? And it is responsive. Sing to the Lord a new song, a song of hope and rejoicing. Praise God for wonderful acts of mercy and kindness. God has remembered God's faithful ones. God has poured blessing upon blessing upon us. Praise the Lord, all the earth. Shout your praise. Rejoice, for God is truly with us. be seated. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we, we come to you this morning 
to worship your holy name. We lift our praises to you, O Lord, for you are our heavenly maker, creator of the universe and everything in it. Your wisdom is unparalleled. You have set everything in its place. You are a sovereign Lord. There isn't a thing that happens that you don't know about. You see all, you know all, and you love all. What an amazing God you are. You created us to be holy, and you love us still, even though we are not. We are dear to you, lost and broken in this world, stuck with our own willfulness and propensity for sin, yet you made sure this was not a lifelong sentence condemning us forever. No, you could not bear to leave us this way, separated from you by a chasm of imperfection and unholiness. It was simply not good enough for you. So you did the only thing that you could to permanently correct the situation and bridge the gap that we could never fix. You provided us with the one and only atonement that would answer for all sin and for all people, which was the sacrifice of your only son, who died a horrific death, sinless and holy, like a spotless lamb, and then was risen on the third day, forever defeating death. Life eternal is now possible with the resurrection of Jesus. All you ask of us is to have faith, for it is by faith we are saved through your generous gift of grace. Thank you, Lord, for we know we could never be holy enough on our own. Help us to remember how much our salvation cost you. Help us to remember how your heart breaks when we bring dishonor to your name. Change us so that we will be more and more like Jesus, for he was good and perfect in all of his ways. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy stretches far and wide, and your compassion for us is ever-present. Lord, in your mercy, <clears throat> excuse me, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We ask for those who are not here with us. We ask prayers for those who are not here with us today. May your presence be felt in each of their lives, and may your blessings abound. We pray for those who are mourning. Comfort them in the way only you can do. We pray for those who are suffering. Ease their difficulties and show them the way through. We pray for those who have questions or doubts. We ask that you give your wisdom and cover them in grace. We pray for our first responders, nurses, doctors, and healthcare workers. We ask that you give them strength and protect them and keep them healthy. We pray for our hurting world. May your goodness be poured out, and may your will be done, and may your mercy be felt. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our every single prayer. It is a gift of grace that you so graciously extend to us. Let us listen well enough to hear your response. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear the scripture from 1 Kings. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper, and 
And Elijah heard it. He wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah?
Well, hello again. It's uh, really great to be up here with you once again, bringing the message. It's always an honor to serve our church in this way. Um, I heard from Pastor Gordon this morning, and he is recovering better than he had been. Um, he said um, uh, he's feeling a little bit better pain-wise, so um, we just want to ask that you keep up the prayers for his recovery. Um, we'll see how it goes from here. So thank you for thinking of him and all your kind thoughts about him. It's really wonderful. So lately, um, as I've been reading the Bible, I've been taking sort of a stroll through the Old Testament, which sometimes I think doesn't always get recognized as it should. And I love to read the Old Testament for many reasons, although I do have to admit that some of it is a little hard for me to understand. Do you think that way too about the Old Testament? I do, I think it's hard. But I like to read it anyway because every time I do, I always find that there's something new that I gain from it or know, you know, something will make a little bit more sense the, the, the next time around, or maybe I'll catch something that I didn't miss. One thing for sure is that there's always something good about reading the Old Testament, and really the whole Bible for that matter, because there is so much to it. There's a richness and depth in all of the scriptures, and it adds meaning to our lives with every single story. But there's really no shortage of things that we can learn from it if we try. Now, one of the reasons I love to read the Old Testament so much is because of the multitude of ways that God shows himself or makes himself known, not only to the people in the Bible, but really to everyone who reads it. From the creation of the universe, to the creation of a nation of people from which our Savior would come, to the parting of the seas, to the pillar of clouds, tablets carved out of stone, burning bush bushes that don't actually really burn up, um, water from rocks, a terrible flood with a family and animals floating in a boat, and a rainbow that signifies God's promise. Even the way that God speaks is really pretty humbling. I mean, can anyone read the words, uh, God's words in the book of Job and not feel a little bit uh, pretty darn small, actually, so... But we also get to meet some very, very ordinary people. People who were just like you and me. There was Noah and David and Sarah and Abram and Hannah and Esther and of course, Ruth. Those are just to name a few. Yes, these were ordinary people, each with their own strengths and weaknesses, talents and challenges and gifts and flaws, just like anyone else. They came from various backgrounds and varying ages, and they brought with them many life experiences. But the one thing they all seemed to have in common was their zealous faith in God. In fact, I'd say that their faith had to be super strong in order to endure what God had called them to. And this is certainly true of most of the prophets. I mean, the prophets were sent by God to deliver messages to the people of Israel, telling them about God's anger over their behavior. When they fell out of line with God's laws, God used the prophets to tell them just what would happen if they did not repent. And we know that this didn't always go well for the prophets. They were persecuted and tormented and even threatened with death for their actions on behalf of God. Well, that is where we find the prophet Elijah in our scripture lesson for today. He was running for his very life. You see, Elijah was sent by God to confront the evil King Ahab, who was the ruler of the northern kingdom of Israel at that time. With great influence from his wife Jezebel, Ahab had descended into worship of the pagan god Baal. In fact, he had even built a, a temple in the name of Baal for his worshipers right in the middle of Israel's capital of Samaria. And over time, Ahab had done more to make God angrier than all the other kings that ruled before him. But the time of reckoning had come, though. One of the most important events for Elijah happened in a grand demonstration of God's power. You may remember the story. Elijah was instructed to show the people that Baal didn't actually exist. That he was powerless, a powerless conjured up figure by the people who strayed from the one and only true God. Elijah summoned, the king, summoned King Ahab and all of Baal's prophets and told them to build an altar with a sacrifice on it. And then Elijah did the same thing. 
And they were told to call upon the name of Baal to consume the altar and the sacrifice with fire. But no matter what they did or how long they stood out there and called out upon his name, Baal was a complete no-show. <laughs> but Elijah called upon the name of the Lord, and God rained fire down upon his altar and completely burned everything up. Now, seeing such a display of God's power caused so many people to believe in him rather than the powerless Baal. And then Elijah ordered all the prophets of Baal to be killed. Hearing of the embarrassing defeat of her God and the demise of the prophets, Ahab's wife Jezebel became enraged and promised to find Elijah and kill him. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that sounds like a good reason to run away. So Elijah heads for the place where he could talk directly to God, to Mount Horeb. But you know, this was a bit of an impertinence though because no one was supposed to approach God in this way unless they were invited. But Elijah was so distraught that he wanted to die. He felt like a complete failure because despite everything that happened, the people still continued in their apostasy and detestable practices and now they wanted him killed. He was afraid, he was disappointed, and he was angry, and he wanted to plead his case before God himself. The journey to Mount Horeb, though, was long and arduous, and ultimately it was too much for Elijah to handle. So he lay down under a bush, hoping and praying that God would just take an end to his life. But that is not what God had in mind for Elijah. So God instead gave him exactly what he needed, which was a deep rest, and he gave him a meal, and then there was another rest and even another meal. And now he would have enough energy and strength to complete the journey to Mount Horeb, which would have ended up taking 40 days and 40 nights. And once he got there, he took shelter in a cave. The next morning, the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? So Elijah laid out all of his complaints before God, as if God didn't already know these things. But he was hoping that God would, he wanted God to take care of things. He wanted God to make things right again. But God didn't exactly respond in the way that God, uh, that Elijah was expecting. Instead, God put on a show like nothing else. He sent a wind so powerful that it tore apart the mountains and shattered the rocks. And then an earthquake came that shook the very ground that Elijah stood on. And then there was a great roaring fire. But God was not to be found in any of these things. It was in the silence that came after these things that God chose to speak to Elijah in a still, small voice, gentle like the faintest of whispers. It was a moment that was so holy and so humbling that Elijah covered his face with his cloak so that he could stand before God. I guess that was kind of what I was talking about a little earlier. This is the grand demonstration of the power of God that meets the finite and broken will of an ordinary human being. See, the thing is, Elijah, Elijah had a reason to go to the Lord. He had valid complaints. The Israelites were well out of control. They had forgotten and forsaken everything that God had said, and they were very much throwing their indiscretions right into God's face. And Elijah was sent to warn him, and he did everything that God had asked him to do, all to no avail. And now a credible threat had been placed upon his life. It wasn't fair. It wasn't working, and no one was listening. See, God wanted, Elijah wanted God to act. He wanted God to do something. It's a bit like when a child tattles. They want the parents or the teacher to make things right again to exact some sort of justice. But often the child doesn't get what they want. Well, neither did Elijah. God took the time, though, to show Elijah what he could do. The earthquakes and the wind and the fire. Well, they were warranted, weren't they? The total destruction of the Israelites by the power of an angry God would have been warranted here. But it was not the time for God to do this. Would not have been in the best interest of the people of Israel and really for all of humanity that he take out the Israelites for their bad behavior at this time. 
That's because there was a greater plan and it was all going accordingly. You see, God was working, wasn't he? But not in the way that Elijah wanted or expected. However, God did give Elijah exactly what he needed, rest and refreshment and restoration, all in preparation for what God had in mind for him. See all the noise and the earthquakes and the winds and the fires? At first glance, they all looked good. The power of God on full display right in front of his very eyes. But that isn't where he actually found God. It took a painful, solemn silence to get his intention. And the silence did for him what the other things could not. Who'd have thought that a mighty God could become even more powerful in the throes of silence. Now, if I'm to be honest, I have to admit that sometimes I'm a little like Elijah. I plead my case before the one person who can make all the difference in the world, and I want to see things happen. I want to see God fix whatever situation that I've brought before him. I guess I want that evidence that he's actually working. And I'm thinking maybe that we're all a little like that, aren't we? I mean, in the midst of our struggles and our suffering, we pray mighty things to God through our tears and through our sorrows, through our anger, through our frustrations. We plead with God, and we want a mighty response. We want to see powerful things take place. We want him to put his foot down to defend us or heal people or to see God's gavel of justice pound down. We want judgment well what we think of judgment anyway we want evidence that shows us that he has actually heard us is it any wonder that he's silent sometimes but then again is god really as silent as we think he is or is it that we're just not really listening if silence and listening go hand in hand, then maybe we aren't silent enough to hear his still, small voice. And who truly knows how to be silent anyway? <coughs> Excuse me. I mean, even in our best efforts, it just may be utterly impossible to be truly silent. Now, some of us may be tempted to think that we engage in silence when we don't have any music playing or the TV on or the cell phones going off but our minds are still being are still very active thinking of all the things that well are on our minds right it makes me think of a time when i was in a truly silent place i was having a hearing test now who has ever had a hearing test yeah exactly that's right you sit in a booth which has been soundproofed and the technician sits on the outside and as I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, I can't think of a quieter place than this. And then I had been wearing earphones on top of that, so it was very, very quiet. So I look around the booth, and I try to figure out how this room was made, and, well, how would they make a room this quiet? How could they make it that quiet? And why did they hang that picture on the wall? And why is this room decorated this way? And why does this room have to be so small anyway? And why isn't this test starting? And what is she doing out there? How long is this going to take anyway? Because look, I got lots of stuff to do today. I didn't realize that the test had started already. In the midst of my rambling thoughts, I wasn't listening for the beeps. And even when I was, I really had to concentrate to hear the quiet ones. So it is with God's voice sometimes. We really have to focus on what we are hearing. And that means listening is the only active thing that we are doing. And that is really hard to do. Because there's always something rolling around in our minds. Like that list of things to do. Like the trouble that we're having. Or about the people in our lives. And that is why we don't always hear the beeps. Or the sound of God's voice. But putting that much effort into listening for God's voice puts God first before all other things. We shut everything off. We tune everything out just so we can hear. We actually search for him, focusing on his voice, listening for anything that he could possibly say. Kind of like when the kids are playing upstairs and you can hear them bumping around and laughing or arguing and making all kinds of noise. 
And then when it goes completely silent, you're going to listen even harder because you know something's up. So see, silence actually makes us listen harder, doesn't it? But like I said before, being truly silent is an extraordinarily hard thing to do. I mean, our lives are busier than ever, filled with every possible activity, with the people in our lives and the places we have to go. Um, we are just constantly going out and doing things. But even if we weren't going out, we are still pretty busy at home too, aren't we? With TV shows, Netflix, movies, electronics, computers and cell phones, why we're even working from home these days. <clears throat> Could it be that we may be totally avoiding silence? It's certainly a possibility, isn't it? Because silence can be humbling. It can even be frightening or even deafening. Silence can force us to face things that we'd rather not, like the sound of our own guilt or the sound of our own shame or the sound of our own anger, or the sound of our own sorrow and loneliness. Silence can bring a person to their knees or force them into sin. Sometimes quiet is violent. I got that from one of my daughter's favorite songs. But it is kind of true, isn't it? Maybe that is why we make ourselves so busy sometimes, to cover up the sound of our own silence. But if we commit our silence to God, then we will hear his still small voice. And it is with his voice that we will change what our silence sounds like. We will find the peace that we are looking for. We will find the healing that we've been longing for. We will find the direction that we have been waiting for. And we will find a connection that is deep and intimate. One that will sustain us and fill us with truth. So yeah, you know, the big grand display of, of God's power may look good to us. It may be something that we very much want, and it may even make us feel better, because at least we'd know something was going on, right? But as we know, God, that's not how God works, although sometimes we are afforded a miracle or a change or a divine intervention. But usually all is going according to a greater plan, even when things are rough and uncomfortable. God is powerfully silent, hoping that we will stop everything and listen for his still small voice. You know, sometimes the hardest lesson that we can ever learn is just how to be still. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and stop worrying. Be still and stop striving. Be still and stop orchestrating. Be still and stop trying to control. <clears throat> Excuse me. Be still and let me handle this. Be still because I've got this. Be still and hang in there because I know what I'm doing. I have given up my very own son for you. Would I not give you everything else that you need? I have heard your cries and I know your heart. Let me take care of this, and I will. You can bet on that. Trust me even when things don't look like the way that you want it to. Trust me even though I feel distant, I am still very, very near. Trust me because I love you perfectly. Grand displays are not always my style, but I am even more powerful in your stillness. Let us pray. Father, we know how mighty you are. You could do anything with just one word. Yet you wait for us in the depths of sheer silence. You want us to hear you. You want us to listen only to you. Help us to wait for you, to set ourselves aside for you so that we can know your good and perfect will for us. Our idle minds are never truly idle, Lord, so we ask for your patience. The art of listening is truly a gift. We thank you, Father, for you only want what is best for us. We pray these things in your name.
Amen. Join us now in the benediction blessing, which is responsive. Go in confidence, knowing that the home that we are all looking for has been so graciously provided for in perfect love. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. amen. Please stand with us as we continue to bless the name of the Lord.
rejoicing in this still small voice.